Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm thrilled uh, to uh, welcome you to this panel uh, featuring amazing women that are connected to Fairfield University, both uh, past and present, um, and who have served with the global community in profound and impactful ways. Um, I want to first start by thanking the Office of Alumni Relations for hosting this event and for inviting us in the Center for Social Impact um, to partner with them on it. Um, so my name is Melissa Kwan. I'm the director of the Center for Social Impact. Um, and our mission is to connect uh, the community and campus uh, to create academic opportunities um, that address local, national, and global challenges and develop individuals committed to creating a more just and equitable world. And the women that you will meet tonight um, really embody this mission. In 2019, and um, Julie Mugal, who you'll meet next, may correct some of my facts here, but I think it was in, in, in early 2019, Fairfield University launched the Peace Corps prep program um, in partnership with the Peace Corps uh, to help prepare students for international development field work and potentially serving with the Peace Corps, among other postgraduate service opportunities, including um, the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. Um, so far, we've had about eight students who have completed the program and 30 more that are uh, currently enrolled. Um, it's my honor, uh, really tonight, my main role is to introduce uh, our moderator, Julie McGall. Um, so Julie is the Associate Director for Humanitarian Action, Humanitarian Action in the Center for Social Impact, um, where she facilitates co-curricular humanitarian related activities and helps to manage the Humanitarian Action Minor, as well as the Peace Corps Prep Program. She has 20 years of international development experience, previously working at Save the Children, where she held positions in development communications, as well as Asia operations, based both in the United States headquarters and in Pakistan. She began her career in, at the International Organization for Migration in Geneva, Switzerland, where she held the positions of Desk Officer for Africa and the Middle East and Project Design Trainer. She's the author of Land Without Hats, a book which explores the difficulties faced by widows in the developing world and their courage in the face of adversity. She received a BA in politics and an MA in international relations, both from Syracuse University, and I'm honored to call her colleague and friend. So I'm gonna pass it over to Julie. Oh, thank you, Melissa. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, thank you to Janet and Jessica for this wonderful opportunity to moderate this panel in honor of the 50th anniversary of women at Fairfield University, which is uh, quite a milestone. So 50 years of women at Fairfield. And tonight I am thrilled to be sharing this space with four of those amazing women. Uh, and you are in for a real treat over the next hour as we hear the journeys, the career journeys of these women. So I have a couple of housekeeping um, points that I wanted to make first. If you have any questions, please pop them into the chat. So we'll be looking at, you know, the chat throughout. And if you are a freshman and are here for Inspire Credit, please stay um, for the survey at the end in order to get your credit. Okay, so those are our, our two housekeeping points. Um, I just wanted to share a really nice quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. Um, it's by Frederick Buckner, And it says, vocation is a place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. And this is certainly the case for these women that I'm about to introduce tonight. So I wanted to kick off the session by first introducing Soraya Bilbao, um, who will start our panel. So Soraya um, has three degrees from Syracuse University, yes. <laughs> she um, graduated in 94 as an undergraduate, undergraduate and then received master's in 2003 and then in 2014. Uh, she served as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Kingdom of Tonga in the South Pacific from 2005 to 2008. In this role, Ms. Bilbao taught English and worked with village youth to identify and implement community-based projects. She extended her service a third year as a volunteer leader and worked with Peace Corps Tonga staff to train volunteers. Ms. Bilbao now works as an English as a second language teacher at Danbury High School in Danbury, Connecticut. Recently, she was recognized as Danbury's 2020 Teacher of the Year. Uh, it was her Peace Corps experience that propelled her to obtain a master's degree with initial certification in TESOL from Fairfield University. So I'm going to hand it over to Soraya. All right, uh, everyone, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Soraya Bilbao, uh, and uh, I was mentioned, I'm an alumni from Fairfield University. 
uh, pretty much undergrad on my two masters uh, from Fairfield U. So uh, uh, go Stags. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm, I'm, thank you so much. I'm so honored to have this opportunity to share a little bit of my uh, experience with the Peace Corps. Um, it was, uh, everyone who knows me uh, can quote me and saying that it was one of the best decisions I've ever done uh, in my life. And um, I'm always thrilled and excited to have the opportunity to share some of that. Um, so today I just want to briefly talk about uh, the decision for joining the Peace Corps, a little bit of the application process, uh, what it was like a day in the life, um, and my experience coming back from overseas and how that changed my life. Um, uh, so the decision to join Peace Corps, honestly, I, I don't remember when I first heard about the Peace Corps. Uh, all I remember is that for a very long time I had wanted to join. Um, however, uh, I have to say a, a big factor preventing me from doing so was just the fear of being homesick and being away from my family for so long. Um, however, it was something that I just knew I had to do. If not, I would continue regretting it. Um, so I, uh, and also I think my friends were getting tired of me of talking about the Peace Corps and not doing it. So finally I said, fine, 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 I'll join. Um, so uh, I, I, uh, I submitted the online application um, and uh, it took about, uh, this was back, uh, I received the invitation letter back in 2004. Um, that's when I, around the time I had applied. So I think that for me, the application process was between six to 10 months. Uh, I've heard other volunteers that could go even a little longer than that. Um, so it's not something that you could just do at the spur of the moment. Uh, from my experience, I submitted the online application. Um, and there's a lot of clearances, there's a lot of interviews, uh, and you get through all of that. Uh, and finally, uh, the moment came when I, I went out one Saturday morning, I remember, and I got this letter, and it was the invitation. And my first uh, thought was, where is Tonga? If they said, welcome, you're, you're invited to uh, serve in the Peace Corps, uh, you'll be serving in the Kingdom of Tonga. And I had no idea where that was. So I quickly uh, looked it up in the map and I said, okay. Um, so based on my experience uh, with the application process, they'll try to match you uh, with your previous experience. Uh, I, I, at that point, I didn't have any teaching experience, but I had volunteered a lot and I had worked in the community in, in nonprofit. Uh, so I had a lot of experience wor working with young people. Uh, so based on those factors, um, they, they try to match you. Uh, during the interview, they did ask me if I had any preference. And my family is from South America, from Ecuador. And um, she had said, because I spoke Spanish, if I'd want to go to a Spanish speaking country. And actually, I actually told her I, I'd go wherever they need me. So I said, however, if possible, I really wanted to challenge myself. And I said, if possible, I'd like to go to a country uh, where I didn't speak the language uh, and it was a completely different culture. Um, I really wanted to experience what it was like not knowing the language, not knowing the culture and and, and just go through, through all of that. And really get, you know, the opportunity to, to experience that for myself. And uh, so um, I received the invitation. Um, now with the Peace Corps, it's not that you get the invitation and go, you go by yourself. What's really great the way they do it is um, you get the invitation, then they send you more paperwork, you know, uh, suggest a packing list. And then you are, you, you, you head off first to what's called staging. Um, and for me, it was staging in, uh, in California and in LA. And uh, at that point, I met some of the other volunteers from all over the country, uh, other trainees at the time, uh, other individuals from all over the country who had also been invited to serve in that particular group. So with my experience, uh, I went as a group to the country. So I, it's not like I flew down to the country by myself. Uh, and that was really good because every, you're, you're very nervous and then you're meeting all these other individuals who are just as nervous and just as excited. Uh, so we had staging for two days, just overview, some more paperwork. And then we flew into the kingdom of Tonga 
where uh, we began a, an eight to 10 week uh, orientation session. Uh, so even then we're, we're, we were considered trainees, not volunteers yet. Um, and the training is extensive. So you're, you're training with your group um, and uh, you, you, for a good part of that, you also have the opportunity to live with a host family. Um, and Peace Corps does a really nice job with the training in terms of culture training, technical training, language tra training, um, safety and security. Uh, so they, so you feel as much as you can prepared uh, to um, serve in the assigned village. Um, at one point, we, we do have to take a language proficiency oral exam. Uh, and then once you, you pass that, then you're sworn in in country as a volunteer. Um, and I was assigned um, to an outer island uh, that was about a half hour from the main island of Nukualofa. So uh, the island where I lived uh, was uh, called, in, on the island called Atata. And uh, in the picture with the white house where, where you see that was actually the house where I lived for about two years. Um, it was it, on the school campus, uh, like a few feet from the water. Um, no windows, no electricity, no running water. I mean, the whole Peace Corps bit. Um, I do. I did have an outhouse. Um, and at first you're like, how am I going to live this way? But then you realize qu very quickly, you realize how easily you get back to basics and how much stuff we have here, uh, you know, that uh, we should be thankful for. And I was. And um, it, so by my two years living on that, on the island, um, it, it just became home. That was home for me. And uh, um, I, uh, during my two years on Natata, I uh, taught English at the elementary, at the government primary school. Um, and I had, I didn't have previous teaching experience. So I did my best, uh, but I did work a lot with young people. So I would teach English. Uh, I worked a lot helping the kids. Uh, we did a play. Uh, and then in the afternoons, I would work with the village youth uh, on the island. And in Tonga, uh, a, a youth is considered someone who's not married. So you could be 50 years old and still be considered a youth uh, in their culture. Um, so on average, the youth that, who I worked with were about 25, 26 years of age. Uh, and we did some recycling projects, um, uh, youth leadership uh, projects where we invited youth from other villages, from other islands to come in and then they would go visit. Um, so pretty much wh whatever the village needed. I, I tried to support them in any way I could. And uh, in the evenings, I actually would spend time in uh, what's called a falakaloa, which is a little good store uh, on the island. The island was very small. It was at most 100 people. There were no cars. It was dirt roads, uh, uh, paths, not even roads. It was like a, a dirt path. There were two bicycles. Uh, and um, so I, I, in the evenings, I would spend it with the female uh, a youth from the village in their little good store. And I, I do have to say one piece of advice for anyone who's interested or thinking of doing the Peace Corps, is definitely get involved with, with, with um, community life. I, I have to say, sitting at that good store, I learned a lot of Tongan uh, just because, and I got to meet a lot of villagers because everyone in the evening went to get coffee, you know, tea and sugar and flour. So um, I, they got to see me and uh, I got to meet them. So uh, it was it was very busy. It was a very, it's a fishing community. So um, I had the opportunity to just uh, experience that. Um, uh, coming back home, I have to ch say the the, cha the biggest challenge for me coming back home, uh, I did extend a third year, um, as was noted, and the, my third year, I, uh, I was on the mainland and I taught English at a high school and helped at the Peace Corps office. Coming back home, the biggest challenge was, was pretty much um, the pace of life here in the States. Um, when I went overseas, it was the reverse. It was getting used to not going at fast speed. Not, you know, they got to the point I didn't wear a watch anymore down there because 
everything is just a, a slower pace. And after three years, you picked that up. And then when I came back, it was very difficult driving on the highway for a while for me because it, I felt like people were flying. Uh, and the other thing that was challenging was going into the supermarket and seeing, being overwhelmed at how much options we have, uh, just the aisle for cereal. Uh, I mean, next time go down the aisle and just really pay attention how many options we have. In Tonga, you were lucky. You found one thing of cereal, you grabbed it because it wasn't going to be there the next week. So you were lucky you got cereal or not. So so I think the pace and the amount of um, options that we have here, uh, we're getting used to that again was, was somewhat challenging. And um, the biggest way that Peace Corps changed my life is that experience had a direct impact on my decision to come back and uh, um, become an ESL teacher, English as a second language. I had never considered teaching in a classroom at a school and having that opportunity in Peace Corps uh, made me want to come back. Uh, I applied at Fairfield, uh, got my TESOL certification uh, and I've been teaching at Danbury High School. Uh, and every day I have the opportunity, now online distance learning, but I had the opportunity to work with students from Central, South America, uh, 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 you know, other, from other countries, usually primarily Spanish speakers and Portuguese speakers, but th th my students come from all over the world and, and having had that experience being uh, as a volunteer in another culture, learning that language and feeling the stresses of, of being in a different culture um, helps me uh, consider and empathize and sympathize what my students might be going through. And so that was the biggest thing. Uh, um, uh, way that Peace Corps changed my life, making my decision to change my career path, uh, my professional career path, and become a teacher. Um, so it, it is the toughest job you'll ever love, as it's as they say. And I, again, it was one of the best decisions that I've made in my life. And I hope you all have the opportunity to to experience that as well. Oh, thank you, Soraya. I have so many questions, but I'll hold back. <laughs> and I know we have some questions also in the chat, but I'll save those till the end so we can all, everyone can answer them. Okay. Um, so next up is Emma Cannon. Emma, I remember Emma from when she was a freshman at Fairfield U back in, I guess, 2010. So, um, Emma is uh, graduated from Fairfield in 2014 and joined the Peace Corps in Guatemala from 2014 to 2016. After returning from Guatemala, she worked in DC providing programmatic support to a Zika response program in Latin America and the Caribbean. These experiences led Emma to the field of nursing. She's currently working toward her nursing degree at the John Hopkins School of Nursing, where she continues to pursue her interest in global health, public health, and maternal and child health. So Emma, let's hear about your journey. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. And uh, yes, I remember spending many, many hours and much of my Fairfield experience in that office. <laughs> and it meant a lot to me. So thank you. Um, so why I decided to join the Peace Corps? Um, well, I would say I, I had a, a interest, a passion in, in international development from the, you know, the little exposure I had had at the time. I just kind of felt a pull. Um, a global pull. And um, I, I felt that having that pull um, to work globally, I, I really needed to experience living in, in different situations um, to really be able to work in different environments. And, um, you know, growing up here in the States, I, I just really felt um, that that was what I needed to do. And um, I had the experience of studying abroad um, for a year while I was at Fairfield in Argentina. Um, and just had a wonderful experience. Um, and I was in an urban area at that time. And I sort of said to myself, okay, you've gone and you live somewhere else in an urban area, but what about a rural area? Um, and that was something that I really wanted to do. Um, I knew that I loved kind of that, that piece of, of going somewhere new and, and learning about a new culture and, and meeting new people. And I just felt that I really wanted to to have that experience. Um, and so I was at Fairfield at the time and I had done um, a lot of work in volunteering with the um, Jesuit University Humanitarian Action Network. And I'd had the opportunity to listen to a lot of people who 
um, worked in international development and learned from them and get involved with, you know, fundraising initiatives and, and community outreach and involvement through the school. Um, and so I really felt that that had kind of led me to the decision. And like Soraya, I was a little nervous that it was a little over two years. Um, I had gone away for a year and, and that was fine, but two years did seem a little daunting. But um, I also just kind of pushed through that and I said, you know, you need to do this now. This is something you want to do and, and um, it's time. So I applied um, and I, at the time when I applied, um, I probably filled out a similar application to Soraya. Um, the application changed um, since then. Um, while I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I, I saw that change. Um, and so when I filled it out, you just kind of wrote down everything you'd ever done in your life. <laughs> and then they read it and they, you know, just sort of said, okay, this is what we think that you are qualified to do. And this is where we, you know, we can send you to do it. So I didn't know where in the world I was going to go and, and what was going to happen. Um, and I just ended up um, being offered the chance to go to Guatemala. Um, I was I think someone had had dropped off and decided not to go and it was very quick turnaround for me. I think for a lot of people it takes a year or maybe even more than that and I applied in March and I had a confirmation um, in June and I left in October. So it was very, very quick for me. Um, but I, I really was appreciative of that. I felt ready to go. So it was, it was great. And so as I said, I served in Guatemala. Um, which is a beautiful country of 32 volcanoes, over 20 different languages, um, and just amazing microclimates. There's beach, there's mountains, there's jungle. I mean, just everything. It's, it's such an incredible place. Um, and so I, let's see, I left in 2014 um, in the fall and um, I also, you know, had my staging experience in uh, Florida, took off and had a training experience. Um, I was working in uh, preventative health education. It was a very, um, very structured Peace Corps experience, which I think is often not the case, particularly with health. Um, in a lot of places, um, health work is, is very grassroots and sort of determined once a volunteer arrives and based on, you know, whatever a community identifies that they would like to work on um, in the health sector. And in this case, I was working with a um, bi-ministerial government um, program through with the Ministries of Health and Education called Healthy Schools. And so we worked in rural primary schools and we supported teachers and sort of um, just really kind of building in more preventative health education lessons um, and just kind of you know, being a support, maybe bringing some like creative or different ideas, um, thinking about how to kind of format the less like lessons and make them engaging for students. Um, so that was kind of the core piece of the work that I did. Um, and in addition to working in a local school district where I lived, um, I worked in a little bit in the in the state. And so I got to kind of take bus rides all over the state and go to different communities and just meet a lot of people and just work to, to support them and, and their efforts with this Healthy Schools program. And I had so much fun um, doing that. It was, it was really wonderful. Um, but to kind of give you a, a day in the life. Um, so a lot of the pictures, let me see, most of the pictures you're seeing here are from my, my Peace Corps site, uh, which is Sheikh Arakoch. And it is a um, Mayan village that is not too far outside of um, the second largest city in Guatemala, which by second largest city, I think I'm talking somewhere between like 200 and 400,000 people. So not terribly large, um, but it was a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, very much um, focused in agriculture. Uh, you can see in some of my photos, a, a very tall volcano in the background. Um, and this uh, erupting volcano that you see is actually just behind that very tall volcano. So there were days that you just see the big smoke cloud billowing up or the ash cloud billowing up um, over Santa Maria, which is the, the front uh, volcano that you can see. It was just um, just very beautiful and um, just, yeah, just so, I don't know, just such a gorgeous, gorgeous view every day looking up at the walls of this valley and this volcano. Um, and uh, flowers are also, this, this is a site from, a picture from near my site, but um, there is a lot of, as I said, agriculture, but also flower, flowers are grown in a lot of different places and, and sold on the market. And 
um, where I lived, they grew roses, which was kind of unique. Um, so I had a rose garden in my backyard. <laughs> um, and it was just a little farm. They grew um, corn and they had goats and some different animals. And we had a manure pit and we had some pigs and it was just, yeah, it was wonderful. And um, I also, I had the experience of living with two families actually. And I lived with another wonderful family uh, in a slightly more kind of urban setting. And uh, that was a, a wonderful experience too. But this, this valley was just such a beautiful place. Um, and in terms of kind of what my, my day would look like, I would wake up and, you know, I was a little sniffly a lot of the time because it was getting, it was cold. I had cold mountain air all the time and I was in a um, cement block house with uh, a tin roof and um, so I'd kind of get up and I'd go over to my little stove. I had a little two, two uh, flame stove connected to a uh, gas tank next to my bed and I just got up and I made my, my food and I bundled up and I jumped on a bus or took a walk or grabbed my bike or hopped in the back of a pickup truck. Um, and I went to schools um, or I met with people working in the ministries of health and education that were supporting the schools. Um, and I was always given an amazing snack because just food in, in Guatemala is delicious and, and everyone is extremely generous. It's a very hospitable and generous culture. And so I was always had something warm to drink, whether it was a coffee or um, they make a lot of um, warm drinks called atol, which is kind of like a ground up um, starch. It could be um, plantains, it could be oatmeal, a um, number of different things. And it was always delicious and, and just so generous. And so they always kept me warm and, and fat and happy. And I appreciated that. <laughs> and so then I kind of got to hang out at the school with the teachers, with the kids. Um, and um, we did a lot of different things, lessons, kind of little competitions and um, plays and different things. And it was a lot of fun. Um, and and then in the evenings, I would come home and maybe have another coffee and a snack with my host family. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was just, a, it was a pretty, it was a slower pace um, for me. Um, I definitely had a lot of work to do, um, but I found a lot of time to just kind of relax and enjoy and, and take in the beautiful scenery and all the people around me, um, which was really wonderful. Um, and I have to say as well, because this is event about women in the Peace Corps that I was surrounded by phenomenal women. Um, I lived with a midwife um, at one point and got to spend time with her and her traditional sauna working with women that were um, pregnant or, or postpartum and um, being there while she was seeing how they were doing, washing their babies, um, giving them an, an herbal drink to settle their stomach. Um, I played soccer with a number of amazing women. I had was supervised by a number of different amazing women. Um, so strong women were a huge, huge part of my experience in the Peace Corps. Um, and probably part of the reason that I, I chose to be a nurse as well. Um, and in terms of, I suppose, um, coming back, um, I, I felt a little bit spoiled when I came back because I um, really only took a break of about a month and I immediately started working on a Zika response program. And um, everyone I worked with almost completely was in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, Nicaragua, Honduras, Ecuador, Dominican Republic, uh, Guatemala, many different countries. Um, and so I was constantly, you know, on the computer talking to them, supporting them. Um, very much still immersed in, in culture and, and the Spanish language. And um, that was an amazing experience too. And I was also in DC, which is very international. So um, I definitely had some, some shocks. I mean, certainly getting back to a US work schedule is different. Um, kind of just reconnecting with people here too. You know, you've been away from your family and your friends for a few years and it takes time to also kind of reconnect with people and you have to you know, give people the space to, to kind of let you slowly reintegrate into their lives. So it's definitely a process. Um, and I suppose I also still have a foot in both places because um, I found my husband on a pickup soccer field down there. <laughs> and so um, half of my family is in Guatemala now. Um, and so I always go back um, and 
see my friends and um, it's a big part of my life. Uh, so perhaps I would say I never really completely adjusted back. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, I would just say I had some of the most amazing moments of my life. I had some of the hardest moments of my life. You know, I, I experienced some loneliness, um, you know, from time to time and, um, you know, saying goodbye to everyone was really hard as well. Um, I had amazing moments too, climbing volcanoes and eating amazing food. I played a lot of soccer. Um, I love to throw myself onto soccer fields of all men and just prove to them <laughs> that women can be awesome soccer players. I also played soccer with a bunch of really amazing women who are really good soccer players, but I still love to do that. Um, and I just, even the market, I loved the market too. Um, that was probably one of my best moments. Um, my host mom sold uh, her flowers in a market. And um, this was a market that was run by um, largely a group of my women that kind of organized and had their own spaces in the market. And they used to have so much fun when she would walk away, she'd say, I have to go buy something or I have to go talk to someone. And she'd say, okay, you sell these flowers, don't sell them for any less than this amount. And the faces of people seeing this just random gringa girl sitting there trying to sell flowers was really funny. So, um, I had some really wonderful moments. I meet a lot of special friends who are close to my heart and, um, just had an amazing experience and I definitely owe a lot of that to Fairfield for um, just kind of believing in me and, and letting me know that those opportunities were out there. So thank you. Well, Emma, thank you so much. I was wondering if you would mention your husband. <laughs> if you didn't, you know I was going to bring it up. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yes. <laughs> Emma, there's a quick uh, um, question in the chat and it's actually from one of our students who went through the Peace Corps prep program. He's asking, what ages did you teach? Oh, sure. So um, I worked in, um, my, it was mostly primary schools. Occasionally it was sort of like the preschool age when they were tacked onto the primary school, but it would have been, oh gosh, um, it would have been kind of like kindergarten to like sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Like a primary, primary school. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Oh, uh, thank you so much. All right. We're going to move on to our wonderful colleague, Sylvia Marsan Sakli, who is an assistant professor of history and the Islamic world. She was a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer from 89 to 92 and a pre-service training director in Tunisia in 1994. As a volunteer, she taught English language and literature at the Teacher Training College and Faculty of Letter Letters in Sousse, Tunisia. She received her BA from the University of Chicago, I didn't know that, and her doctorate from NYU in the Joint Program of Modern Middle East Studies and Modern European History. Dr. Marsan Sakli's research focuses on state society relations, colonialism, as well as the politics of post-colonial memory and history writing. Sylvia, off to you. Okay. Well. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak on this uh, panel. Um, I'm just going to go through. We decided, you know, to talk about, you know, uh, common topics, and um, you know, what made me want to join the Peace Corps. Like Soraya, um, I I come from a uh, from a Hispanic background. Uh, my parents and I am from Cuba, um, so I'm the I'm an immigrant and a child of immigrants. Um, and it, uh, when I told my parents, uh, after, in my junior year of college, after they had, uh, sacrificed a lot to put me through a very, very prestigious school that I wanted to go overseas and volunteer <laughs> and not take the usual, you know, the, the route of either being a doctor or a lawyer, they nearly had a heart attack. Um, and so, you know, they said, what, what do you want to do there? You know, and uh, for me, it was the belief that to whom much is given, uh, much is expected. Um, I also, uh, you know, there was a purely selfish reason too that I wanted to see the world and I didn't have the money to do, you know, to do that, right? Um, and I wanted to go as far away as possible to experience, um, you know, what it was like what it might have been like also for my parents, you know, to come, um, you know, completely, I mean, I, I was too young, I was eight years old, but, um, but for my parents to, you know, to kind of understand their journey too. 
Um, so initially, you know, it, like Soraya said, you know, it was it's that it, the the motto is the toughest the toughest job you'll you'll ever love, right? But in my case. Um, it was the toughest job you'll ever love and will never have. Uh, that's what, at least that's what I felt like because I initially joined, um, I worked for a year after I graduated to gain experience uh, teaching. So I, I was teaching at, uh, I, I was teaching ESL at a community college. That got me experience to, um, to apply. Uh, they initially offered me a job, uh, a position in, um, in Honduras. And I did not, but, you know, like a lot of you, like, like, again, so I would say, you know, um, I, I wanted to have a completely different experience um, and not, I already speak Spanish. Um, so I wanted to, you know, to be in a completely foreign environment. Um, so they put me back into the drawing and uh, I was selected to be one of the group that went, that was going to, the first group to go to China uh, in the Peace Corps. It was a very political um, position and situation. Um, there was a lot of select and, uh, se se uh, selective processes, but the hardest thing I think for me was convincing my parents who had come from Cuba <laughs> that all of a sudden, you know, uh, I had graduated from college in the United States and was going to join the Peace Corps as a volunteer, not get really paid, and go to communist China. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, they also had, you know, so I faced a lot of interrogations in the family. You know, are you sure you? want to do this. Um, so we were at a staging area in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. Uh, we put in 13 hours a day uh, of language, um, uh, uh, protocol, etc. As you can see from the pictures, I never made it to China <laughs> uh, because I ended up in Tunisia. Um, I left in uh, 1989 and it was the year of Tiananmen Square. So the program got canceled uh, in the middle and uh, Peace Corps, in order to make up for that, um, gave us the choice of going um, wherever possible, you know, wherever that they had an opening. And I knew that if I went home, I would never probably leave, <laughs> considering, you know, how opposed they were for me to, to leave. And so I said, just put me on the next plane anywhere, right? Um, I really had, uh, from a very young age, an interest in the Middle East. Um, from the time that the King Tut exhibit came to the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, uh, I really wanted to see an Arab country. And um, so the first, um, the first uh, um, uh, assignment was in Tunisia uh, and it was teaching teachers or would-be teachers. Um, like I had just graduated. Um, so uh, these are my students back here uh, on the bottom. Uh, so they were almost as old as I was. And so, you know, how to manage your uh, persona and your um, and your authority in the classroom was a really big deal of my Peace Corps experience. Um, I was also evacuated um, during my uh, time in the Peace Corps in Tunisia um, during the Gulf War. Like I said, it's the toughest job you'll, let, you'll, you'll always love and never have, right? And so I was evacuated in um, 1991 came back home for six months. And then I, uh, the Peace Corps needed people kind of as goodwill ambassadors because the entire group had left um, uh, as goodwill ambassadors to come back. And so I, um, I decided to, um, to add another year and I came back. Um, so um, I left in 1993 and then in 1994, um, they needed somebody to run the pre-service training. Um, again, for you know cultural translation reasons, and so I um, I worked um, as as a as a pre-service trainer. So um, what you see here are images. So I'm going to take you to a, through a day in the life of my first set of uh, so my first journey. Um, so what you see is my is my room. I shared it in, in my apartment. I shared it with another Peace Corps volunteer. Um, this this was my bedroom, um, and it overlooked. Uh, we were in a very, I wanted to have the, you know, the traditional experience. So I went into the Medina. Uh, I, I, we, we got an apartment in the Medina, um, which was the old city and a uh, lot of traffic of people every day from the morning, from the minute that the sun rises until, you know, it sets. Um, so we were above uh, where the, where the uh, metal workers um, uh, were 
living and trading. And so we we rose up every day at 6 a.m. in that window uh, to the sound of tapping the metal and Bob Marley singing So Much Trouble in the World and Buffalo Soldier. So I had those soundtracks like every morning, Bob Marley and <laughs> and the tapping of the cobbler and everybody talking and, the, and then the street sellers, um, you know, yelling uh, for whatever wares that they were selling. Um, so my retreat was this kitchen, <laughs> which was not too far away from the bedroom because it was, you know, um, it, it was a very small place. Um, so uh, this was our little kitchen and we had in here, um, so uh, the only way we could get hot water, this was our hot water heater, which was our most prized possession there. Um, because although you think that it's very, you know, it's kind of uh, desert-like in many places and it's hot, uh, and the summers are unbearably hot, but in the winter, it's really cold. Um, so uh, lugging up our uh, gas bottle, uh, which was like a 50 pound weight up the stairs uh, was one of the things that I remember uh, <laughs> going through every, you know, every so often. Um, what you see here, so this is my sec, this is not exactly my second house. <laughs> this is from, uh, so when I re-upped uh, in the third year, um, I lived in, um, in the sixth floor apartment building. Um, it was the only place that I could get. Um, so this was my view overlooking that apartment building. So uh, the, the trouble uh, that I had with the gas bottle only complicated itself uh, when I lived six floors up. So uh, this is the thing that I dreaded was the, you know, when the, when the gas bottle runs out, right? Um, my whole life was tied to the gas bottle. <laughs> um, and um, these, are the, these are some images. Uh, this is the street, one of the streets that we were, um, that we lived near. Um, so you can see kind of the uh, the closed quarters and you know the the traffic. And every day that I went to school um, in, in the faculty of letters, I would have to pass by a whole um, a whole street of sellers, and they keep and so they see you every day. Um, and so uh, it's inevitable that you're going to get the cat calling, right? And so I, my, my favorite one was, um, uh, there's my teacher, as beautiful as a flower, but she always wears the same jacket. <laughs> so, um, you know, we learned to laugh um, after, af after a while, uh, navigating ourselves as uh, women living alone. In uh, in the public space um, was was a was a was a skill, right? Um, not I'm always smiling, and so we were instructed, you know, don't don't smile, look straight ahead. You've got that invisible veil, you know, um, unless you really want to engage in a conversation with someone, right? Um, after a while, when people actually knew you and knew that you were a familiar face in there, that was not necessary at all. I mean, I was such a known quantity in that entire Medina that I would stop and speak to everybody um, and, you know, would joke around and, and spend time. It would take me a long time to go through my to my destination because everybody wanted to talk to me. Um, and there was no sense of threat after that point. Um, the other thing that you get to see um, is, and so I included the inevitable, um, you know, camel picture in here, um, because one of the things that Peace Corps does offer you um, is the opportunity to travel. And I really took advantage of that um, as much as I could, you know, saving with the little money that they, you know, that you, because you're at the kind of the minimum, the average wage, right? So I would save on every little thing I had. I, I, I almost put in here, um, a picture of one of my typical meals, but um, but I decided not to. <laughs> uh, it's because you're saving every penny, right? And this is when I went to Egypt finally, um, and it was kind of my dream come true. This was near the border with the Sudan, uh, with the Sudan, um, near the camel. It, so it's a it's a camel um, festival and um, a trading of camels. So um, I I rode on there, and it was it was you know the touristy thing to do. Um, the picture here that you see are my students, um, and they spoke English just like I did. Um, honestly, I taught literature, I taught um, the novel. I mean, I was a I was a behavioral sciences major in at, at the University of Chicago, so I really had to learn. You know, when you talk about projecting authority, I you know I was right one step ahead of them. You know, uh, we taught Lord of the Flies. 
um, introduction to the short story, um, composition. Um, this, uh, the classes could be as large as um, 200 students. Um, this was one of my smaller classes. Um, I had, you know, students kind of pulling in chairs from, um, from other classes and, and it was a really a wonderful time of sharing. Um, I think they taught me more than I ever taught them. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, you uh, that I carry with me, um, and, you know, and kind of part of my, my, my personal mission is, um, to humanize the other, um, particularly because there's so much misunderstanding in this country about this part of the world, about Arabs, about the Arab world, about Muslims. Um, and really for me, it was, uh, it, was a, it was an incredible experience. I'm not gonna say it was always easy, right? Um, there were a lot of mental challenges, particularly because we were there in a time of war um, in the region um, and Tunisia supported Iraq. Uh, at least the Tunisian people did, uh, but I never really felt threatened. Although I could understand, um, I could understand the perspective um, of people on the ground um, with respect to the region. Um, and it was really hard when I was evacuated back um, in the middle of the Gulf War, Gulf War One, 1991, to enter the space of um, United States kind of coverage of that war. Um, it felt really, um, it, it felt like I was on another planet, <laughs> you know, so you're, you are, you are exposed to the propaganda universe of one country and you enter the propaganda universe of another, even though we normally think that we have a free press, right. Or a kind of a, um, um, you, you, you really see that, you know, it's like that joke of, you know, two fish swimming in a pond. And then, you know, they say, you know, how's the water? And he's like, well, what water? Right. Um, Cause you really, you swim in the water, you swim in a kind of water that you are not really aware of that you're swimming in a water. And, and the Peace Corps experience really made me aware of that um, in ways that I cannot even describe to you. <laughs> um, and I don't know what else do you, um, I guess that's, um, that was the hardest thing for me to, to kind of uh, adjust back. Um, and it was uh, adjusting back twice um, from, um, from my Peace Corps experience. Um, yeah, uh, that's about it. Great, thank you. I do remember that King Tut exhibit as well. I went to it. <laughs> We're kind of giving hints at our age. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, so moving on to Bridget Mulcarin. She's our most recent grad from Fairfield University on this panel. She um, is originally from New Jersey and graduated Fairfield in 2017. As a stag, she majored in international studies and minored in environmental studies and peace and justice. Whenever you thought about Bridget, you thought about the environment. <laughs> Um, she served with Peace Corps Senegal from 2018 until March 2020, when she was evacu evacuated due to the pandemic. Uh, currently, she's living in Reno, Nevada, where she is serving as an AmeriCorps VISTA and studying for her master's remotely as an international environmental policy student at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. Bridget, over to you. <laughs> Yep, the environment definitely got me hooked. <laughs> um, yeah, I was an environmental volunteer in the Peace Corps. Um, so uh, what made me decide to join the Peace Corps, I think it was studying abroad in Tanzania through Fairfield. Um, studying abroad there really changed me entirely, honestly. Um, and I know that sounds a little cheesy, but if you knew me before and you knew me after, it was a different person. Um, being, and also environmentally, being exposed to the open landscapes, the beautiful mountains, I had the opportunity to go on safari, like it just really hooked me in. Um, so any students that are here tonight, if you have the opportunity to study abroad, I would highly recommend it. Um, and so after Tanzania, I pretty much knew I wanted to do the Peace Corps. I started applying my senior year. I was not getting in. I think I had two or three interviews, two interviews before um, just getting denied. So I went to um, the AmeriCorps. I decided to do AmeriCorps instead as um, kind of a stepping stone and build some more skills. Um, and I joined AmeriCorps and I was sent to San Jose, California 
Um, and I was an urban forestry nonprofits volunteer coordinator. So I got to play in the dirt and play with the trees all day and talk to people and get them excited about it. Um, and then when I ended up applying for Peace Corps again, um, I got in pretty quickly because they were like, we get it, girl. <laughs> We've seen your name a few too many times. So um, yeah, that process ended up being pretty quick. Um, and if you look on the map here, I included a picture of Senegal. Um, so you can see the north, it's called a Sahil environment. So the north is the Sahara Desert, and then you start to move down into the more lush. I was luckily where that green dot, or sorry, that red dot is <laughs> in the lush green area. Um, as an agroforestry volunteer, most people didn't want to be up north because you can't really grow trees in the desert too easily. So I definitely was lucky. Um, but my region had not had an agroforestry volunteer or volunteers at all for about 20 years. Um, because you can see the Gambia River there. Um, the Gambia has an interesting history. When the English came in and they took their boats down, they took it as far as they could fit their boat, and that's where they drew the Gambian border. <laughs> um, so that's what the Gambia is, and they speak English there, and a language called Mandinka, which is actually the language that I spoke. And although it is the national language of the Gambia, it was a very um, minority language of Senegal. So um, there was no bridge going over that river until last year. And so it was really hard um, here at the tip of Dakar. Um, that's where the capital is. That's where you'll find a lot of resources, a lot of nonprofits work there. But to get down to that um, red dot there where I was in around Seju, you had to go around the Gambia because there was no way to get around the river or you had to take a boat down and then inward. So the area lacked a lot of... Um, resources, they were very, um, they have very, uh, not a lot of food, not a lot of nonprofits working there. They were pretty much ignored. And so there was um, threats of a civil war to the West in Ziggenshore. And it kind of um, went all the way to Seju because it, it's in the Kazamans region. Well, it is the Kazamans region, but <laughs> sorry, I don't know why I put quotes, but. Um, and so it, they were gonna secede from Senegal and that's why there was no volunteers down there for about 20 years because of um, threats um, of volunteer safety. And so I was the first one in there. So although I was very far away from any other volunteers um, in any other regions, I had about four other volunteers that I was within 10K of, which was really rare. Other people were sometimes up to two hours away from other volunteers. So I had the opportunity to work um, with different volunteers in different sectors. Um, and it was really rewarding in that way. Um, so yeah, I was in Sitaba here and it, they speak Mandinka, as I mentioned. They said it was about 700 people, but a lot of people will move up north, they'll go to Dakar or bigger cities to work. So it really only felt like ever 500 people about, 300 maybe, I don't know. It felt, it didn't feel very big. And then the city that was closest to me, Seju has about 24,000 people. So it was a really tiny area, um, but it was really nice that within that region, everyone spoke Mandinka because once I would try to take a bus up north, east or west, I would be lost and alone <laughs> and really uh, working through my broken French to try to communicate that I had to find a bus somewhere. Um, so in that way, yeah, it was really interesting and, and really challenging um, to be that minority language um, and to not be able to, um, I never really got the opportunity to have, I feel like deep conversations with people because it was um, just really challenging to get a handle on the language. Um, and a lot of the other volunteers around me spoke French and they were also learning Mandinka, so they were able to ask more questions in French um, and things like that. Um, so my day in the life was always changing um, because I was the first volunteer down there. It was a lot of people getting used to a foreigner living there. Um, and so that was a challenge, um, but also really rewarding because I got to kind of, um, I don't know, be the first <laughs> person that people knew. So, you know, kind of break their expectations um, in a lot of ways, which was cool. And I'm sure they also, you know, my expectations change as well. Um, 
I biked a lot. I um, worked on a couple projects. So uh, mainly uh, I did some tree nursery work, teaching people how to mix soil, build compost and get prepped for the rainy season. The rainy season was only two months long and the rest of the year was about 110 degrees. <laughs> and so it was um, always, I was always hot um, <laughs> and I would pull water and you know, sometimes you'd get really discouraged because you would just work so hard to pull water out of a well and it would be brown and you're just like, what is happening? Um, so yeah, always a challenge, always hot, but always fun. I got, um, I became best friends with my bike because um, I just really enjoyed that time alone and it gave me time to think. I found that exercise was a really awesome way for me to work through whatever was going on. Um, I lived with this host family here. Um, so that's actually my American family and my Senegalese family all together. Mm -hmm. I was really lucky when I was accepted to the Peace Corps, I came home and told my family and my mom's response was, oh, John, we got to go to Africa. <laughs> and he <laughs> said, no, we don't. <laughs> And they did, they all came and it was really fun and really rewarding. And despite my dad saying that he did not have to come, he um, really seemed to have the time of his life. Um, I, my parents never traveled. I never really left the country until my experience at Fairfield. So um, it was so awesome. You know, just, he was holding hands with my host dad because that's what men do there. They hold hands and um, it was just, like worlds colliding was was really awesome um and then that bowl next to that picture of my family is um a really nice Senegalese wedding meal um that is kucha those like green blobs um or bisap and okra and you like whip them up and it gets that like gelatinous um kind of texture and usually that would be in the center and giant and it was mostly what I ate because I'm vegetarian and I've always hated fish and they ate fish every single day <laughs> um and so it was uh that was also a challenge I was often just eating plain white rice and going back to my room and being like oh my god it's hot and I am hungry for chocolate mm -hmm. and peanut butter um but it, we made it I made it through um definitely a learning experience and um, let's see, let's make sure what else. Oh, and other projects I worked on were, um, I had a middle school club with a Let Girls Learn program. So thank you, Michelle Obama. Um, and that was really fun and really rewarding. And I got to work on that with another volunteer. Um, and we had like, the girls showed up every time and we were like, how is this happening? How are they all coming? Like, this is crazy. They have so many other things to do because girls there have so many responsibilities. Like really feels like the men sit and drink tea all day. Um, but the girls, like they work their butts off from the time they are so young. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. So that was, that was um, a really awesome experience. And to do it with another volunteer was awesome. Another project that I did was a master farm project, which is like a sample farm to try to extend seeds to people. Since the region was so food insecure um, and it's like one hectare and they show you improved practices and they should have trainings twice a year. So I was lucky to get that done before I got evacuated by COVID, which I forgot to mention. Um, so yeah, I was evacuated in March. So I'd actually be leaving right now, um, but here I am. <laughs> um, and yeah, other projects I worked on was trying to create um, low like cost beehives out of recycled materials because Bees are really great pollinators and they also are um, bring in some income and they're also really good for people's health. So it was kind of like um, what I thought would really be a like a perfect circle project basically. Um, unfortunately, I didn't um, get to complete that project, but I know some of my friends there are still beekeeping, so that's good. Um, and lastly, I will talk about my dog there. Her name was Sai Sai, which means troublemaker. And she was my very best friend. Um, yeah, so she uh, was just my buddy through everything. Uh, for some reason, the second I got on the airplane, I was like, it's time to get a dog. <laughs> and I knew, and she came running up to me one day and I took her in and, um, you know, Senegalese people really were confused by the fact that she could mm -hmm. fetch a ball, that she could sit, that she could lay down when I asked her to, that she would come when I called her. And like all those types of things were fascinating and kids love playing with her. My host dad who hated dogs, um, she actually, despite getting 
fixed. She ended up having puppies. So um, <laughs> she had two puppies. And when my host dad like saw the puppies and, and got to know them, he was like, next time she has puppies, I want one. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really like breakthrough for me. Cause I was like, he knows that this can be a companion and it's not just something that needs to protect your fields from the monkeys and things like that. Um, so that was really breakthrough because most of the dogs there have scars. They're, she got kicked in the face all the time by people just randomly. Um, so me kind of breaking down that barrier, I think was honestly the biggest project that I did. Um, and uh, unfortunately she was on her way back here, um, but she passed away. She got sick um, like the day she was supposed to fly home here. So. She would have been sitting right here, but it didn't happen out, had happen that way. Um, but yeah, she's, she's a great dog. And I think she lived a good life. And our experience together is priceless. Apparently, after I got evacuated, she would stand at my door and like howl for me. <laughs> Little babe. Um, so yeah, since coming back, um, as mentioned before, with the cereal aisle, I'm kind of still going through it. <laughs> um, I went to Target last weekend and was like, oh my God, this place, so many things. And where do they all go? Back to the environment. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, but I also, um, when I was evacuated, um, I stayed at my grandparents' house. They were not there. They have a second home in Florida where they are in the winter. So I got a couple of my Peace Corps friends. Actually, I was like, come quarantine with me. And they did. So we stayed there for about a month. And so I was able to decompress, sleep a lot, watch TV, and not really think about anything. Um, so that was nice. Um, I've also been lucky that my best friend from study abroad, my best friend from college, my best friend from my AmeriCorps, they all did Peace Corps. So I have, um, and my boyfriend did Peace Corps too. And so, yeah, I have an environment of Peace Corps. One of my Peace Corps friends in Senegal mentioned, he was like, we're ruined for the rest of our lives. We'll always, we'll always be only friends with Peace Corps people, which is not true, <laughs> but um, he definitely just saying like the experience is very unique. Um, I think the urgency to protect the environment is something that has changed since I came back. That's why I'm studying environmental policy. Um, we actually send a lot of our trash to Senegal and it's a coastal nation, very low income. And so they can't manage it. Um, since China stopped accepting ours, we started sending it to low income countries, Senegal being one of them. And so that was definitely something I was like, we need to stop this, this is so bad. Um, and another one is that most of the women in my um, village, they farmed rice on a, the Casamance River. And with salt intrusion, the soil is getting really bad and the salt is coming from the ocean because the sea level is rising. And so this is just very urgent to me. And um, the reason that, yeah, that it's changed me so far and it just makes me want to work harder um, for the global community. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, thanks for everyone. I really enjoyed hearing everyone else's mm -hmm. stories as well. It's so mm -hmm. great to, you know, see the different places and no Peace Corps is alike even within the same country. So it's really cool to hear about all different places in the world. Mm -hmm. Bridget, we have a quick question for you um, from the panel, um, not from the panel, from the audience. Would you return to Senegal or another agriculture sector in a few years to finish up? Um, so yeah, I would do Peace Corps again because it would be starting from scratch. It wouldn't be me um, being able to skip the training process or learning a new language. So it would definitely be challenging, um, but it is not something that I'm totally against. Um, I was able to spend a year and a half there. So um, in, a, in some sense, I feel like I, I got a lot of time in, but in others, you know, I feel like seeing my friends in their last couple months really made me want to have that experience. Cause in those last few months before you leave, it seems like they were like, really taking everything in and I, I wish that I had that. So it's not off the table. I don't know when, mm -hmm. um, but potentially. Right, great. Um, I'm really conscious of the time. So I wanted to ask, and it's probably not fair, but I have one quick round robin question for each of you. Um, and you'd have to answer it in one sentence or two. All right, you ready? Uh, what did you notice or learn about your inner strength? You wanna start us off, Soraya? <laughs> Um, I guess uh, pretty much that I can overcome challenges, um, even at times where you think that you may, you're, you don't have the inner strength, but you power through and you realize that you can. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go in reverse, we'll go in the same order. So uh, Sylvie, no, wait a minute, uh, Emma came next. 
Um, yeah, I, I would say um, you just, I think when things were hard for me, I just kind of turned inward and I had to work some things out and you, you have some difficult nights and you have some difficult days and um, you dig deep and, you know, I think you work it out within yourself and you also seek the bonds that you've made in, in the community to, to fulfill that um, and, and to kind of just foster more of that inner strength as well. Mm -hmm. Sylvia, inner strength? <laughs> I think the hardest thing for me, as far as the inner strength, was uh, the second time that I came, that I that I went, um, because there were a lot less Peace Corps volunteers, so there were a lot less. I was really alone, in many ways. There were about ten of us in the entire country, so I could calculate that I could be fifteen hours by myself without, you know, seeing anybody. But the winters were just were just horrible, um, and you 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 really do, as Emma said, you dig deep. Um, you have your reserves of strength. Um, you find the strength. Um, either you know you 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 read. Uh, you 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 have a conversations with other people who are authors who, um, you know who who can share their world with you. Right. Your reading is part of a of a companionship as well. So I really found that as well. Um, and but it was tough. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Bridget, inner strength. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've never been challenged so much in my life. <laughs> so um, I think it's just, you know, that you get up the next day and you go back out and you try again, no matter how much people tell you your language is horrible, even though you should know it by now or you miss someone's last name. Because <laughs> in Senegal, they try to teach you by like putting it in your face that you're wrong. And then you're supposed to like, you know, kind of get that fight back. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I never got that. So it was really hard. But um, yeah, just knowing that you did it yesterday, you can do it again tomorrow. You take it day by day. Domang, domang, as they say in Mendinka, little by little. That's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your fascinating, inspiring, amazing stories. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, I do have a quick survey. So if you are here as a freshman for your FYE credit, please just fill in that survey um, for all of our students on the call. Um, and then I just wanted to put in a quick plug uh, for our programs in the Center for um, Social Impact. So here we are with our current students at the UN when the UN was opened, right? Um, so in the center, we have something called the Peace Corps Prep Program, which is a new program. So Bridget and Emma, you wouldn't have known about this, I don't think. No, because it just started a, a, maybe two years ago. So, um, and I did notice that we have some people on the call who went through our Peace Corps Prep Program and one person on the call who was waiting to go out into the field. So Carly is with us on the call as well. So I hope she enjoyed you know, listening to the journeys and hopefully she'll get out into the Peace Corps field very soon. Um, we have 15 students enrolled uh, from the class of 2021. And last year we gave out eight certificates or we didn't give out eight certificates. The Peace Corps issued eight certificates to our students uh, last year. And then in 2019, we had six students receive uh, Peace Corps prep um, certificates. Uh, we have 35 students in the pipeline. Um, oh, I was just I was just reading out a quote in the in the chat. So someone wants to know a little bit more about the Peace Corps prep program. That's great. So um, and we are one of the few Jesuit universities who we might be the only Jesuit university who offers this program. So it's really been such a wonderful program. Um, and the Center for Social Impact co-runs it with um, international programs. And it was really Anita D. Carlin's brainchild. So we really do need to thank Anita for getting that to um, Fairfield University. Um, so we have a number of pathways that students can follow to do international and to do humanitarian action work. Um, Emma was one of our humanitarian action fellows, uh, a Ju Han fellow. So she, she helped us to run our student club for a couple of years. Um, and we do have a humanitarian action minor that uh, we have at the university, which is one of the few um, in the country that runs a program for undergrad. So it's a, really a unique program to uh, Fairfield University. Um, we have our student club. We have lots of student leadership opportunities uh, that students can um, sign up for to do humanitarian action. Um, and we try to raise awareness and integrate ethical, political, and historical context into development and humanitarian action. So 
uh, that's who we are. And for any students on the line, we would be more than happy to provide you with more information on any of those programs. Um, and once again, I would like to thank, you know, the um, alumni office for putting this together for us and Jessica and Janet in honor of the 50th anniversary of women at Fairfield. And we really kicked it off well tonight with four very strong, amazing women. So thank you so much to all of you for sharing your journeys. And it was so nice to see you.